Greetings from Castle Goring, from Mickey, Aurora and from me. I will, without further ado, plunge right in because I have a certain amount of ground to cover and time is of the essence. So, if Aurora will allow me, I will plunge right in. D. Marchant says, Dear Lady C, Please, please, could you explain the latest development in the House of Lords with the pairs discussing if Harry and Andrew should remain councillors of state? I do believe you were hinting something was afoot in this regard for some time. Is there hope? There is, and I'm going to read out something from Pamela R.G. because this also covers the same terrain and it affords me the opportunity to answer both questions at the same time. Dear Lady C, thank you so much for sharing the whole piece about what the late Queen thought of Megzilaya. I don't know who that is. No idea. Strumpet is a perfect word <laughs> to describe her. I think the Queen actually said she was a cut above a strumpet. I think. But anyway, I would like to ask you if you read in the news that in the House of Lords today, there was a question raised by Viscount Stansgate to reform the Regency Acts. It's the first time the House of Lords has raised their concerns about the issue of amending the councillors of state, especially pertaining to the Duke of York, quote unquote, who has left public life and the Duke of Sussex, who has left the country. Apparently, this will be another scandal brewing if this is not amended in time, especially when the King and Queen Consort go abroad. Apparently, the royal household responded that no decision has been taken about this yet. Please let us know what this is about. What are the chances that this will be done sooner? How will they amend it and what do you think the changes will be? Thank you again for your expertise on so many matters. Thanks for your kind thoughts and your kind words. Uh, this relates to the Regency Acts of 1937 and 1953. Basically, the Regency Acts say that councils of state are drawn from the spouse of the monarch and then in descending order, the most immediately available adults who are in the closest in the line of succession. So it goes, it's, it's drawn from a pool of four, each of whom has to be immediately in the line of succession before or after his or her neighbor, so to speak. In his diaries, Tommy Lassells, the celebrated private secretary to George VI, was, and then the Queen, was quite cutting about the Regency Act and the fact that this meant that because George Lassells who became the Earl of Harwood, who was the Queen's first cousin, son of the late Princess Royal, Princess Mary, was a prisoner of war and therefore could not perform his duties as a council of state. And his immediate cousins, Princess Arthur of Connaught and Lady South S were then going to have to be called upon to do it. Well, nothing has really changed since then. And there is now and has been for some time bubbling on the surface, the fact that there might be more 
appropriate councillors of state if you open up the scenario, so to speak, to let in others in the line of succession who may be lower down the line of succession, but are possibly perceived as being more appropriate for the role of council of state than those who trump them higher up in the line of succession, but for one reason or the other are not regarded as desirable to be councillors of state in terms of public perception. Prince Andrew, because of his difficulties uh, arising out of the accusations of Virginia Dufry, and Prince Harry, because he doesn't live here. Because he is domiciled here, he still qualifies as councillor of state under the Regency Acts but he doesn't live here and also his unpopularity is such that people don't want him. They would soon have Prince Edward and Princess Anne. My understanding is that the way forward, which will be the least controversial and the least legislatively difficult way forward, is to amend the act so that you add new dimensions rather than taking away anybody's entitlement under the old acts, which means that those immediately in the line of succession will still qualify as able to fulfill the role, but the role, the, 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 sorry, the requirements will be so expanded that, that others will qualify. For instance, the Earl of Wessex and the Princess Royal. So instead of taking away anybody's rights, they're going to add a whole new set of rights to open up the subject, so to speak. Let's wait and see what happens, because these things are done in consultation with the royal household and parliament. And what is interesting is that Lord Stansgate is the one who has introduced it. The subject and to those of you who don't know Lord Stansgate is quite a member of the left-wing establishment. He is better known as Hilary Benn. His father was Tony Wedgwood Benn who was the second Viscount Stansgate and who renounced his title so he could continue sitting as a Labour member of the House of Commons. So he was a Labour MP. Very eminent, the Wedgwood Benz are from a very eminent family. Wedgwood, you know, China people. Married to a very rich American. Of course, they're both dead now, but he was married to a very rich American. And they are real left-wing royalty, in quotes. But they are not revolutionaries, the family. They would like to, they, they push for peaceable and legal change. And I think it's very commendable of Hilary Stansgate, who incidentally sits as a hereditary pair. He's one of the 92 hereditaries. He ran for and was elected to be one of the representative hereditary pairs in the House of Lords. Isn't it interesting? His father renounces his title. 
he can't gain, doubtless because he's too grand, he can't gain a toehold in the new political scenario through the electorate. So what does he do? He does it through the old traditional House of Lords route. <laughs> you really do have to say, you know, the British system is truly wonderful because it allows you to have a chance even when you're trying to rip down the very platform that gives you the chance to rip it down. Mm. I suppose that you'd call civility at its height. Annelie Vosloo says, Lady C, a bit off topic, but what will happen when a young person first, second in line for the throne wants to pursue an academic career? Let's say become a medical doctor or a physicist. Well, the short answer is they would be allowed to do it. Uh, Prince William, for instance, was allowed to be a helicopter rescue pilot. Uh, but if somebody wanted to become a doctor or a physicist, there is nothing to prevent them from being. And indeed, you have a head of state at the moment who is a medical doctor. And what happened to him in terms of what he had to do with his career is doubtless what would happen to the royal. And I'm referring to President Assad of Syria, who is a doctor. He had to give up the medical profession to be president of Syria. And at some point, there would be, a if once there was a direct conflict, the royal would either have to give up his place in the royal system or would have to give up his career. There are ample precedents for royals who've had to give up their careers to fulfill their royal duties. Prince Philip, he was a naval officer. He had to give up his naval career when King George VI got very ill and he and the Queen had to step into the breach. He spent the rest of his life doing an alternative career. Princess Arthur of Connaught, she was a state registered nurse from 1915 and even in 1940, she is photographed outside of her nursing home, 23 Bentinck Street, London, still functioning as a nurse. She was called Sister Marjorie. That was her nursing name. Princess Mary, the previous Princess Royal, she was also a nurse. She studied at Great Ormond Street Hospital and she remained in the nursing profession in an ad hoc sort of way for the rest of her life, not functioning as a nurse, but pushing nursing forwards because she had a more eminent position than Princess Arthur, who was able to continue working as a nurse. You have Princess Marie Bonaparte, Princess George of Greece, who was one of the two lay female practitioners trained by Freud. The other one was his daughter, Anna. Anna Freud is still a very eminent person in the psychiatric world. Princess George, less so, because she was not as eminent as Anna Freud, but in her day, she was very eminent, and because she was an exiled royal, or when she wasn't exiled, she spent very little time in Greece, she was able to dabble in her profession in a way that other royals who have had to give up their great love have not been able to. I'll use another example. Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyll, that wonderful statue of Queen Victoria that's outside of Kensington Palace 
in Kensington Gardens was sculpted by Princess Louise. Princess Louise was a very gifted sculptress and artist, but she was never able to pursue her artistic career to the extent she would have liked because her royal duties kept on intervening and interfering. You have another one, Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians, very gifted sculptress, very even more gifted than sculptress, very gifted musician, concert standard. She was a queen, she couldn't go around performing, so what did she do? She created the Queen Elizabeth of the Belgians piano competition, which is still one of the top five piano competitions in the world a century later. But at some point, you have to make a choice. And it is regarded as unacceptable to shelve your royal duties for your personal interests. Royal duties being state duties are supposed to come before personal preferences. This is something Harry did not understand. J. Paul says, Meghan Markle will be choking Another one of her hateful lying narratives about Britain being racist, being destroyed as we get our first non-white prime minister. So wonderful to see King Charles invite him to form a government with a gift of Diwali streets for our Hindu PM. God save the king. Well, J. Paul. Can you imagine poor Megsy baby, the suffering she's enduring? Yet another one of her false narratives shot down. This time that the British people and the British royal family, let's not forget them as well, are racist. Although the British royal family has nothing to do whatsoever with the choosing of a prime minister. But the British people certainly do. And the British state system certainly does and the British political system certainly does. We now have a Prime Minister of colour, the Mayor of London is of colour. I could go on and on, but I think we've got the point, pretty much. Yes, Megsy Baby must be choking. How dare they do that to me, those who conservatives can you believe it how dare they choose a prime minister of color oh, it's just awful but everybody still hates me and it's because they're racist not because i'm hateful I'm sweet and jolly and wonderful and don't you just pull up how marvelous i am and i'm so modest and playful he <laughs> kicked my feet in the air <gasps> and oh gosh i'm just like julia <gasps> julia roberts in case you don't remember but not julia roberts when she's playing that hooker no never i'm a feminist i would never use my feminine wows never <sighs> never Harry, fancy some roast chicken. <sighs> Martina McCosker says, Did you read the article in Cosmopolitan yesterday, Lady C? I'm afraid I don't read Cosmopolitan. I didn't even read it when I was in it. The writer said there was a good chance that the Harkers would be offered Windsor Castle to live in. I kid you not. What's the betting Meg's PR are floating ideas around to see how they land? What a hoot. Martina McCosker, nail on head, very firmly hit by you. Mm. Well, of course, we all know that Meghan and Harry wanted Windsor Castle and the Queen 
declined to endow them with Windsor Castle. Well, obviously, she would have done that because she's racist. I mean, it had to be racism. It can't have been any other reason. I think what we really ought to focus on is the fact that Meghan and Harry shouldn't only be given Windsor Castle. They should be given Buckingham Palace as well. Because, I mean, let's face facts. Why would they not be given Buckingham Palace? It's being done up at the moment. And Meghan would be able to effect change, one act of compassion and abuse at a time. She'd be able to effect change. I mean, wouldn't, not only would she go in there and be able to sort out all those workers who had tea breaks and all of that nonsense, I don't believe in coddling staff, but she would be able to update Buckingham Palace fabulously. Maybe she should also update Windsor Castle while she's at it. You know, everything greyish and beige, magnolia and white, white on white, and everything antiseptic and colorless. Mm. I know that Prince Charles, sorry, the King, doesn't particularly want to live in Buckingham Palace, although I think he's going to have to end up at least doffing his hat at occasionally living there but let us see what happens there because Buckingham Palace is being done up and as it's being done up it's not really fit for habitation but I think if you believe that Meghan and Harry have any chance whatsoever of living in Windsor Castle Unless, of course, as she is quoted as having said, that very welcome. Sorry, she didn't, she wasn't quoted as saying this. She was quoted as saying uh, that they're one plane crash away from the throne. Well, if that very welcome plane crash should happen. <laughs> and she's on the throne. Oh my God, isn't it going to be fabulous? A proud, confident woman of colour. <laughs> not only an actress and a feminist and uh, somebody who knows all about roasting chicken and making waffles and crocodiles uh, mm. i think you get the drift <laughs> lee foster says dear lady c love your videos you have an excellent balance between covering serious topics and hilarious commentary. Thank you. Ever thought about doing stand-up? <laughs> I don't think so. Thank you very much. I'm not a comedian. Sorry. Oh, I may have been brought up to converse and be witty over a dinner table, <laughs> but I'm not a stand-up comedian. I wouldn't be able to do it. Nevertheless, sweet of you to think so. I have to tell you, I loved Joan Rivers. Goodness, wouldn't I love to be Joan Rivers' mach too. Anyway, to continue the question, keep up the good work. What do you make of Meghan's latest claim of being 43% Nigerian? Most people are under the impression that Doria is mixed race and Meghan is three quarters white. What do I make of this claim? Well, Megan is using her podcasts to answer critics and position herself so that uh, she crams down everybody's throat. Her, the vision of herself that she requires us to abide by. There is a very dictatorial element and devious and manipulative and assertive and authoritarian element to the whole thing. 
So in her latest podcast, she's now addressing about angry black women. Well, you know, what Megan seems to forget is that there's no stereotype of angry black women. There never was. So if there wasn't a stereotype, and there is certainly is no archetype of angry black women, this is Megan yet again using the nearest bandwagon to hop onto and hijack for her PR purposes. She's trying to defeat the observation that she is an angry woman, irrespective of her color. And of course, because she knows in the world we live in, it's easier to get away with seeing angry white women than angry black women, because then you're accused of racism. But let's not forget how effectively she plays the race card. For instance, when she instructed the ITV and the BBC that they, she, she did not want any middle-aged white men. That's right. She didn't want any middle-aged white men criticizing her. <laughs> so she's obviously a boosting her claim to being black. So she's now saying she's 43% Nigerian. Now I'm Jamaican. I studied history. I studied the history of slavery in Jamaica. Not only have I read about it subsequently, but at school and we were given wonderful history lessons. No slave ended up coming from only one place, or practically none, because they were imported and they were made to breed. Most slaves were therefore from various parts of Africa, all thrown together, all intermingling, and therefore creating new slaves. Because remember, they were property and they became more valuable the more they reproduced because that meant there were more slaves. That prevents the likelihood of any descendant of a slave being purely one African nationality. So if Doria is 86% Nigerian, the likelihood is she is several other percentages of a African nationalities. Maybe Doria is 120% black, I'm Jamaican. All Jamaicans know all about spotting mixtures and spotting degrees of color. It's something we were all, it's a part of our culture. There is nobody that I know who would look at Doria and think she was 86% Sub-Saharan African. Nobody, I certainly don't accept that she would be 86% Sub-Saharan African. Now, I'm not accusing Megan of lying. I am saying, however, there is a distinct possibility that if the results that she has quoted were accurately conveyed, that they are wrong. I know of a case where identical twins, for fun, went in together. One went to the left and the other went to the right. They came back with 
completely different results. That's not possible with identical twins. Their genetic structure is identical. That means the results were wrong. I would submit to be a very generous to Megan, especially in the light of her well-known tendency to embroider and recollect versions of facts that no one else seems on the same page with, that to be generous to her, even if those results are as she says they are, they are wrong. Just going off Doria's look. Now, I wrote Meghan and Harry the real story, and I did Doria's genealogy. It's there in the book. Doria is not 14% white. She's a heck of a lot more than 14% white. Not only do you look at her and see it, but off what her genealogy said, because she has quite a lot of white, mulatto, and mixed colored is what the categorizations were in those days, in her genetic makeup, in, in her ancestry. Of course, it plays well for Megan to say that she's effectively, to use the old fashioned term, a mulatto, because that's what she's saying, that she is, and I'm using the old fashioned term specifically because it goes into degrees and we are speaking about percentages. She's the one who's brought up the subject of percentages and she's saying she is 7% short of being a full blooded mulatto that means her children are nearly quadroons, quarter. Well, I'm sorry. I'd never seen a quadroon that was that white with such U European hair as both those children display. And blue eyes. They don't have any obvious racial features that are apparent in terms of color of skin, but in terms of coloring, let's leave it at coloring, in terms of coloring of being anything but purely white. Is, uh, is Megan hinting that maybe those children were not produced from her eggs? Is this a hint? Or is it that we're supposed to believe that they are the only quadroons on earth that, that look 120% white when in fact they are 20 whatever percent, 21 and three quarter percent are sub-Saharan African? I mean, the whole thing is an insult to people's intelligence. But of course it plays well and it creates controversy and it creates uh, conversation and it creates speculation. Quite frankly, this sickens me. It sickens me that she is using race the way she's using it. And it sickens me that she expects intelligent people to believe that those two lily white children are nearly, if not totally quadroon, to use the old fashioned word that is what gives the percentile. I'm using these terms because they give the percentile, nothing else does. I think 
I feel such distaste for Megan in doing things like this. I am repulsed that this woman can, under the guise of pride in her heritage, be expecting us to believe that she is 43% Nigerian, which means that she is most likely, if not a total mulatto, nearly a total mulatto, instead of a quadroon, which is what she certainly looks to me as if she is. Of course, if the rumours that have proliferated for some time about her paternity are true, and I have never addressed them because I thought they were unseemly, but since she has brought up the percentile, I think at this point it is only appropriate to mention that there have been rumours circulating for some time that she is not Thomas Markle's daughter, that she is the product of a of a relationship that Doria had with a black man or a man of significant color, then the percentile becomes more understandable. At which point I think her father, her, her official legitimate father, should maybe ferret around and get some of her DNA, he doubtless has has some from the past, and maybe do a DNA test to see if she's anything to do with Thomas Markle. Maybe that would explain her extraordinary conduct, cold, callous, unfeeling, ungrateful. Maybe that would be some explanation as to why she has felt entitled to dump on him from the height she has. This is so disgusting and repellent, this whole subject and the way it is dealt with is so disgusting. I don't know about you, but it, ma it makes me feel defiled. OFH says, Lady C, I am often appalled by Sussex fans praising Harry for increasing the valuation of Better Up. They don't understand that he has done this by selling Better Up his title. They also don't understand that his purpose is to pump up the pre-IPO valuation so that the company can float at an overinflated valuation, allowing the founders and key investors to exit the company, stinking rich billions raised while leaving shareholders with the shares that typically tank after the flotation. This is the typical startup exit strategy from my experience. You sound as if you are very knowledgeable about money. This is, you're absolutely right. This is a very, very much a standard tactic, but I will continue your question. My question to you is, and I'm going to skip, my dear, all the very nice and kind things you said about me, because flattering as they are, and gratifying as they are to hear, your question is so succinct, I don't think we need to drain any of its merit by including any of the kind things you have said about me. Do Sussex fans not understand that H's job is to sell, 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 and increase the subscriptions to plump up the valuation and not to selflessly help the common man or to coach, which of course is supposedly the job of the company, coaching. His role is to get people and companies to part with money to, infl to inflate the bottom line. 
I myself cringe when I hear his startup and corporate marketing spiel at these conferences. Not only you, sweetie pie, not only you. He is a corporate salesman and a shark, now making millions for founders, investors, and himself, as opposed to for the common man. I'm cringing right now as I write this. I would love your take on this. Sending you and the girls much love. I absolutely agree with you. When I see him with them, I just think, you people are playing the public in the most distasteful, gross, flagrant, transparent way possible. Are people really so stupid as to believe this clap trap? Sadly, sometimes the answer is yes. I think it is a cynical exercise in public relations that is a prime example of why royalty should never engage in commerce to, in the way that Harry is engaging in commerce. I'll tell you, if better up ultimately tanks, Harry better be prepared for the fact that he's going to tank as well. And if he thinks there's going to be any wriggle room, I've got news for him. There isn't. There isn't. Because people are watching him. People who have supreme distaste for his commercial activities. And yes, Better Up is doing what many companies do. Before they float, they pump as much air into the balloon as possible in the hope that their flotation will be successful. And do they then dump the stock? Very often, yes, that's how they make their money. Will BetterUp do it? Will BetterUp be one of these companies? I'm not making any accusations in that regard. All I am saying is it totally disgusts me that any British prince could be flaunting himself, his position, his royal name and status the way he does. And the clap trap he talks. I mean, Elmer Gantry, snake oil, here we come. Snake oil, snake oil. Better up. Maybe a wonderful idea. It may even be a wonderful enterprise. Would I put a penny of my money? <laughs> Do I look like a fool? <laughs> Anna Moore says, Lady C, I saw in the papers that King Charles has listened to people like you who are opposed to the radical slimming down of the monarchy and has done an about face and will not be slimming down the monarchy. Do you think that's true? I hope it is. <coughs> Do I think it's true? Yes. And I'm delighted he's come to the conclusion. My perplexity always was that he had this idea of a slim down monarchy when he is so knowledgeable of an adept at charity work. 
I've been doing charity work now for 51 years. I know the score. I know the role, the integral role the royal family plays and the completely necessary role that junior royals have, what you could almost call peripheral royals have. And I've said this before in keeping charities afloat and giving rewards to the average ordinary person who deserves them. You know, mayors, school teachers, you know, all those royal visits, 98% of which are unsung, not reported upon, but matter to people. So it's not only the charities, it is the below the parapet people in this country whose labors need to be acknowledged, recognized, rewarded with royal visits. And they are. I always knew that the numbers could not possibly stack up with a slim down monarchy. And I'm delighted to see that the word now is that he is not cutting down beyond the 11, but he has to supplement those 11. Princess Alexandra is well over 80. The Duke of Kent is batting 90. I mean, I went to his 80th birthday party and it was ages ago. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester are well into their 80s. Prince Edward and Sophie are not exactly spring chickens either. I mean, Prince Edward is, if not a senior citizen, getting there very quickly. They will need young blood. They will need new members of the family as they come of age. I would be very surprised if down the line, Princess Eugenie is not incorporated. And let's, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to poison anybody's pond, but let us see what happens in the future because there are not that many younger royals who are able to step into the breach. And breach there is, and it is going to be an ever yawning divide which needs to be filled. And Prince Charles should have known that, yes, the Prince's Trust is a huge charity, but there are thousands of smaller charities in this country that need royal support. And when they get it, they flourish. And when they don't, they suffer. I know what I'm talking about. I used to sit on some of those committees. I am still patron of charities that rarely need a push from the big ups. Let's put it that way. Melody Bromer official says, Dear Lady C, very much enjoy your videos and insights. I simply must remark upon poor Megan she can't even take a stroll on a Sunday with an unknown girlfriend without being followed, photoed, and worshipped. Mega, mega, mega. Mega, mega, mega. Isn't it amazing? Poor Megan. The paparazzi follow her everywhere. But you notice, I'm going to interrupt and then resume and say, you notice in those papped pictures that they are walking, they're talking, they're moving position, they're this, they're that. She had to have known they were there. What happened doesn't make sense if it's not a put up job. But I'll come to that in a while. I mean, it's sad that she is forced to spend time away from her invisible children. But we must all remember that she does not want the spotlight. 
and the British paparazzi were simply too much for her. So she calls up the candid paparazzi yesterday so she could have some girlfriend time. No one has a clue who this ill-dressed and rather unsightly girlfriend is. Well, let's not be mean about her, sorry. Anyway, if that's your opinion, you're entitled to it. Likely a very dear friend, or most likely an employee, darling, most likely an employee. What really deserves mentioning is how hideous megadrama looked, dishevelled, unkempt, and wearing a pair of MC Hammer inspired pants, tube top, <laughs> Turkish shitter trousers, whatever those are. <laughs> Sorry. She reeks of ugliness. Poor Archie and Lily. They are receiving the worst possible education in mediocrity or worse. I couldn't agree more that those children are receiving an example of everything that is mediocre or worse. But it is interesting to see that she is yet again not taking Sunshine Sachs's advice. She is overexposing herself. She is a glutton for attention. And she will stop at nothing to get and keep on getting attention. And we are supposed to, with those pictures, think, isn't Megan wonderful? I mean, look at those fabulous legs, no calves, big feet. Uh, you know, look at, she's so glamorous with that hat and the glasses and no brown skin. No, it is no brown skin. Oh dear, what happened to the brown skin? Oh gosh. I mean, I've never seen anybody change color like her. I mean, just unbelievable. In our face 24 seven. But you know, she is achieving her objective, which is to keep people talking. She is succeeding in part, she is achieving her objective, the part she's failing at. And this is where the ravishment and imposition, the ravishment of our sensibilities and the imposition that she places upon us by grabbing at attention constantly where it all falls down is everything she does turns one off if one has any sensibilities whatsoever but i would imagine people like megan given a choice between a bad attention and no attention at all, will always take bad, bad attention. I had a friend called Eli Wallet. Eli was Bernie Kornfeld's partner in iOS, Investment Overseas Services. It was a huge, big deal in the, must have been 60s. And it ended very badly because Eli did a boardroom coup and got rid of Bernie. They were best friends from Brooklyn, teenage best friends. And I knew both Eli and Bernie separately. And Eli did a boardroom coup, got rid of Bernie. Then... Eli was got rid of by, I can't remember his name, Robert Vesco or something like that, who made off with hundreds of millions of dollars in 
been must have been late 60s early 70s Robert Fesco was his name I think I think he ended up finally fleeing to Cuba and fell foul of Castro <laughs> big mistake to make but anyway it completely tarnished Bernie's reputation and it tarnished Eli's reputation. And Eli was a piece of work. He tried to kill his wife, his first wife. He was totally unscrupulous, as it turns out. Could be charming, but totally unscrupulous. And Eli conceived a great passion for me and I had no interest whatsoever in him uh, except as somebody to have dinner with. And Eli said to me once, he said, because I would have said something along the lines of, you know, don't you realize that, you know, you never get prevail with me and you know you don't get the attention you want so why bother and he said to me you don't understand it but no attention is worse than bad attention i've never forgotten it and I think it's true of Megan as well. She would prefer good attention. She'd prefer to be worshipped. This is her aim, just as how Eli would have loved to be loved. Why anybody in their right mind would have loved him is something else again. But there we go. Oh. Uh, Eli was the expert on the subject and Eli was totally ruthless, unscrupulous and as they would say, a piece of work. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell. And please keep the questions and comments coming in. Remember, this cannot be done without you. God bless and goodbye.